All right. So uh, if you go to Orlando, the big draw in Orlando, Florida is Disney World, right? But then you go to the other amusement park over there, right? The other amusement park, which is Universal, right? So you got Disney, which has four parks over there, and then you got then you got the other park. Um, so you got your sinusoids, sine and cosine, and then you have your other trig functions. And in 5.6, we're learning about the other. You can say it like that. You can say it kind of with downhearted emphasis. The other, like quote unquote, you can even put quotes around it. The other trig functions. So does that mean that they're not sinusoids? They're not sinusoids. They're not because their names do not have sign in them. Um, does that mean they're less important? <clears throat> oh, I wonder what Caitlin Clark just did. Um, huh? Mock draft. Yeah. All right. So we'll start with tangent. There's four other trig functions left to learn about. So go ahead and get your notes out and put your New York Times uh, diversions away. Yeah. Did you get the wordle for today, Brady? Okay. Uh, we'll start with tangent. Now, we could do the same thing with tangent that we did with uh, sine back in the day, make a table of values and plot the points. But I'm just going to walk you through it. We know the unit circle now, don't we? Oh, I lost my notes there. We know the unit circle. So uh, real quickly here, let's just take the tangent values uh, on the y-axis and the angles and radians on the x-axis, and let's start plotting some points, okay? First of all, what would the uh, tangent of zero radians be? What's tangent of zero? Zero. So I'm going to plot the point zero, zero right there. Got it? All right. What's tangent of pi six? Come on now. Don't forget that. What? Square root of three over three. Absolutely. Thank you. Square root of 3 over 3, that's the y value. So we put the dot right there. What's tangent of pi fourths? Thank you. Tangent of pi fourths is 1, so that's why there's a 1 there. What's tangent of pi third? Ryan? What's tangent of pi thirds? We'll ask Ryan. Ryan, what's tangent of pi thirds? Wow. No. It's just the square root of three. Yeah. Okay, good. So what's happening to the tangent values as we rotate on the unit circle from zero towards pi halves? They're increasing, right? They're increasing. Now, everybody, what's tangent of pi halves? It's D and E. Very good. Now, why is it D and E? Is it D and E because there's a hole, or is it D and E because there's a vertical asymptote? Yeah, if you if you know, remember the ordered pair on the unit circle of it, pi halves is 0, 1. Tangent of theta is y over x, as Ryan just reminded us walking in. So that will be 1 over 0. Anytime you get non-zero over 0, that means the graph of that function has a what at that point? A vertical asymptote. Yeah. So what's happening to the tangent values as we rotate in quadrant one from zero to pi halves is the tangent values go from zero towards infinity to infinity right there. So we can say this right away. The limit as x, we're using x instead of theta for angles, as x approaches pi halves from the left of tangent of x equals what? Infinity. We know we're, we're comfortable with the limit notation. The limit as x approaches pi halves from the left of tangent of x is equal to infinity. All right. Now, that infinity means two things. It means d and e. <clears throat> infinity is not a number, so we know the limit doesn't exist. But it tells us why. It's because there's a vertical asymptote there. Now, similarly, if you were to rotate backwards for negative angles into quadrant four, you would get these values here. And negative pi halves is coterminal with 3 pi halves, and that's going to be d and e again, this negative 1 over 0. 
So that's going to be another vertical asymptote. So now we can say this, the limit as x approaches negative pi halves from the right-hand side of tangent of x equals what? Negative infinity. Negative infinity. Okay, so this right here, from negative pi halves to pi halves, this is called the principle. Like the principle is your pal, means the main one. The principle um, branch of tangent of x. Principle here means the main one or the primary one. The principal branch of tangent of x. So my question to you is, let's move this unit circle mess. If you wrote it over there, let's move it over here. What would happen as we rotate uh, on the unit circle, not from zero to pi halves, but what if we rotated from pi halves to three pi halves, okay? What would, what would tangent of, what would be the next pi thirds right here? As we rotate, what would be the next pi thirds over here? Two pi thirds? What would tangent of two pi thirds be? Over here in quadrant two, tangent of two pi thirds. Negative square root of three. Yeah, it's negative. So it's going to be down here. It'll be negative square root of three. All right, cool. As we keep going, what would what would tangent of the next one be? Uh, five pi fourths, or, or or sorry, three pi fourths. What would tangent of three pi fourths be? Negative one. So that'd be right there. What if we go to five pi six? What's tangent of five pi six? Negative square root of three over three. And then we come over here to pi. What's tangent of pi? Zero. So what's happening from here is the graph is coming from negative infinity and it's passing, it's increasing slowly to pi. So it's kind of doing the same thing from pi halves to pi, if you want to highlight it. It's doing the same thing from pi halves to pi as it was doing from negative pi halves to zero. Yes, yes? You'll see that? All right. Let's continue out uh, going to one rotation here. The next angle here would be 7 pi 6. What's tangent of 7 pi 6? We're in quadrant 3 now, down here in quadrant 3. What do we know about the tangent values in quadrant 3? Are they positive or negative? They're all positive because x and y are both negative, right? So negative over negative is positive. So we're back above the x-axis. It's positive square root of 3 over 3. At 7 pi 6. All right, what about at um, the next one would be 5 pi fourths? What about at 5 pi fourths? What's tangent of 5 pi fourths? Positive 1. And then the next one, what would it be for uh, 4 pi thirds? Square root of 3. It's going to look like that. And then finishing all the way around at uh, 3 pi halves, uh, with 3 quarters of a rotation, 3 pi halves. We're not quite yet at 2 pi. What's tangent of 3 pi halves? D and E, it's coterminal negative pi halves. So there's another vertical asymptote there. So what's the graph doing from pi to three pi halves? It's doing, it's going to infinity again. So it's doing kind of the same thing from pi to three pi halves as the graph did from zero to pi halves. Do you notice any symmetry between those two? Are they the exact same shape? Very good. Let's talk about the symmetry. If you're looking at symmetry right now, this function does have origin symmetry. Like what other one that we've already talked about? Sine or cosine? Which one also had origin symmetry? Sine. Okay, good. So what that means is it's an odd function, which means tangent of negative x is what? Do we forget about it or bring it out front, the negative? You bring it out front. It's equal to the opposite of tangent of positive x. So that just means opposite inputs have opposite outputs. And you can see that there at uh, negative pi-fourths and pi-fourths easily. Negative inputs or opposite inputs have opposite outputs. All right. Um, what about, let's look about this. What about the, what about the period? Remember, the period is the smallest span of x for which the function repeats itself. 
Does the graph repeat itself from pi halves to three pi halves like it did from negative pi halves to pi halves? If we were to make a stamp, could we just stamp it out again from pi halves to three pi halves? Thank you. I think it looks the same. The yellow parts coincide. My values aren't in the same spot because I drew them by hand. And the purple spot, the hot part that I highlighted is the same. So it looks like the graph from negative pi halves to pi halves is the exact same shape and format and stretchy or whatever ad adjectives you want to use from pi halves to three pi halves. So the question is, to find the period, I think we just need to know how far is it from here to here? Pi, one pi. That's different than sine and cosine, right? Because for sine and cosine, what were their periods by default? Two pi. You had to go once around the unit circle to get the y values to repeat. But for tangent, it repeats every half cycle. So the period, the length of one cycle, is pi. That's probably one of the most noticeable differences uh, for tangent from sine and cosine. The other noticeable difference is the, is the discontinuities. In fact, every one of the four uh, trig functions that remains will have a discontinuity in it, a vertical asymptote. Sine and cosine are the only two that do not. Okay, um, very cool. Let's go ahead and come down to example one now, and we're going to draw it. I'm going to show you what I would expect to see if I had you sketch a couple of cycles of the graph of tangent from scratch without uh, looking at it like that. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and say we're looking at f of x equals tangent of x. This is sketching the parent function. This is what I would expect you to know. Looks something like that. Here's what we're going to do. If we're, if our period is pi, I need to come up with some type of way like Sahala and Chala to help me remember how to graph it. So what I call this point right here is it's basically where the graph changes its curvature. What what special point do we call a graph where it changes its curvature from inflection point? Good. I'm going to call that an IP. So it's an inflection point. And then the next critical value is at pi halves, which I'm going to call A for asymptote. So if, if, if your parents drink a lot of beer that has a lot of hops in it, they'd be drinking an IPA, an India Pale Ale, a okay? very hoppy type of beer. Uh, very bitter. We're going to use IP for the inflection point and then the axis or the A for asymptote. A is for asymptote, not axis. That's why I can't use that for, for there. So we've got inflection point, asymptote, inflection point, asymptote. And if I work backwards, there'd be another asymptote there. So how far apart are my inflection points from my asymptotes if the period is pi and they're spaced exactly in between each other? Pi halves. Good. So that's another noticeable difference. We're going to count by half cycles, not quarter cycles. Remember, for sine and cosine, we counted by quarter cycles. Remember that? Well, now we're going to count by motor cycles. Oh, sorry, by half cycles. So one half of the period is one half of pi, which is pi halves. There is no more important value then on the graph of tangent than pi halves. So when we do our parent function, here's what we're going to do. We're going to start at zero because that's an inflection point. And then we're going to put a mark at pi halves. That's going to be a vertical asymptote. And then I just keep adding pi halves. What's pi halves plus pi halves? Pi. pi. Now notice I'm spacing them the same. So there's pi. And then the next one would be where? What's pi plus pi halves? Three pi halves. That's going to be another asymptote. And I'll go one more. What's three pi halves plus pi? Or pi halves, sorry. Two pi. And that's going to be an axis or an uh, inflection point. So that's going to be two pi. So I just went from zero to two pi. And notice what I'm doing. Every pi halves, which is a half cycle, I'm going asymptote, inflection point, asymptote, inflection point, IPA, IPA, IPA. Now I can work backwards, too. By the same distance, that should be negative pi halves. And then the same distance, that should be negative pi. The same distance, that should be negative three pi halves. And then I'll, I'll extend it a little bit. That should be negative two pi. 
And now I can put my marks there. It's going to be asymptote, inflection point, asymptote, inflection point. Okay, so now I've set the table. This is how we set the table for a graph of tangent. Now all I got to do is put my graph on there. So we know it does this. It's increasing and it launches through the origin. Now, remember when you drew the graph of x cubed? When you went through the origin, you had to flatten out. You had to go horizontally because that's what x cubed does. It actually turns horizontally through the origin. But tangent doesn't. Tangent and sine both cut through the origin at a 45 degree angle. So go through there kind of at a 45. It looks something like that. This right here should be a 45 degree angle, a slope of one. Okay. And then you just repeat it. You come from negative infinity, you launch through pi at a 45, and then you go up, you come down from negative infinity, and we'll stop there. And remember, you're also changing the curvature there. So there should be a noticeable change in curvature at the inflection point. You launch through at a 45, and it goes from concave down to concave up. And we just continue on this side. Boom, at a 45, launch it up, and then I got one more over here, like that. And I can extend it if I want, right? How many cycles have I drawn here from negative 2 pi to 2 pi? Four. Four. Three that are connected, and then I got two half cycles on the ends, right? So that's a total of four, yeah. Sine and cosine only make two cycles from negative 2 pi to 2 pi. Tangent makes twice as many, four, okay? All right, this is a good time to start listing stuff. The first thing we want to list about is domain. What's the domain of this function? Is it all real numbers? Heck no. It has vertical asymptotes that aren't in the domain. How many vertical asymptotes does this graph have if we keep drawing it? Infinitely many. How do we list the domain <coughs> if there's infinitely many values that are not in it? Well, it's easier to state the values that don't work than the values that do work. Do the values that don't work, namely the vertical asymptotes, do they occur at regular intervals? They do. So here's how you can list it. You say the set of all x such that x is not equal to. Okay, we're going to say what it doesn't equal, and by default it means all the others work. All you got to do is pick your favorite one. We have, we have to have a starting point. Pick your favorite vertical asymptote location there. I like pi halves. It's the first positive one. Most people pick pi halves. And then it's just going to be multiples of how often they occur. Multiples of how often they occur. How often do these occur? Not every, the, the critical values are every pi halves, but the vertical asymptotes are every pi, right? They're one full cycle away. If you have a graph of tangent and you can spot two consecutive vertical asymptotes, you have a full cycle trapped in between there, okay? So it's going to be pi halves plus pi n, and then we put a comma and we say where n is an element of z. You remember what z was? It was the integers. Z for integers from the German verb zahlen to count. So that just means we're looking at full multiples of pi. n can be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or it can be negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. That's how we subtract full cycles of pi, okay? So that's how we do it. We, we, we find our starting point, and then we say plus pi n, because pi is the period where n is an integer. Plus or minus pi. I could say plus or minus. I could, but that's unnecessary because n is an integer, and integers could be negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. And so if I include negative, negative whole numbers, which is what the integers does, I don't need to say plus or minus. Would I take off if you put plus or minus? No, no, but it's unnecessary. Mathematicians like to be as efficient as possible. Now, if I say plus or minus, then I can say n is an element of the whole numbers. Because remember, the whole numbers are just 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The integers are all the whole numbers plus the negative whole numbers. So um, I'm just going to leave it as Zollin, the integers, and I'm just going to say plus. But I'm glad you pointed that out. All right, any questions on how to do this? Because this is going to be kind of a, a, a theme throughout the rest of this section when we're finding domains of all the rest of them. Pick your favorite one plus multiples n of how, how often they occur. Okay. What's the range of this function? Oh, my gosh. This one's easy. 
all real numbers. So you can put the double bar R. All real numbers. From negative infinity to infinity, we get them all. We get them all. Nice. Okay. What about increasing or decreasing? Is this function increasing and decreasing, or is it just increasing, or is it just decreasing? Increasing. So it's only increasing. So we say that this function is monotonic or strictly, either one. Strictly increasing over its domain. That's important. We can't say it's increasing for all real numbers because its domain is not all real numbers. It doesn't exist everywhere. But once we state the domain, we can say it's monotonic increasing or strictly increasing over its entire domain. It's doing one thing and one thing only, baby, from left to right, and that's going uphill, kind of like Sisyphus and his rock. All right, let's list the equations of the vertical asymptotes. I'll ask you for that on a test. Now, remember, the equation of a vertical line is x equals. x equals is the equation of a vertical line. Do we already know the equations of all the vertical asymptotes? How do we already know that, Brady? The domain. The domain excluded those x values. And now for the equations of the vertical asymptotes, instead of excluding them, we just say x equals those. That's where the vertical asymptotes are. So, yeah, we could just say the vertical asymptote equations are at pi halves plus pi n. Uh, we still got to say n is an integer. If you don't say n is an integer, then you leave it open for n to be a real number, like 1.5 or 3 or something like 3.2. We're not looking at whole cycles anymore. All right, the zeros. Let's look at the zeros. Those are also known as x-intercepts, aren't they? Or roots. They're also known as roots. How many of those do we have? Infinitely many. How often do they occur? Every, every pi. Pi n, yeah. So for the zeros, we could say x equals again. And you pick your favorite one. Andrew, what's your favorite one to start with? Zero is a great one to start with, right? So you could say 0 plus pi n, where n is an integer. Now, because 0 plus pi n is just pi n, do you even have to say 0? Or could you just put pi n? You don't have to put 0. Absolutely not. You can just put pi n. Can we just put pi n on the vertical asymptotes? No, because that means we start at 0, and there's not a vertical asymptote at 0. So we have to start with pi halves. Um, these, by the way, end up being the inflection points. These are the IPs. Now, if we shift this graph up or down, the inflection values will no longer be the zeros. I don't want you to think that the inflection values are always the zeros. If this graph moves up or down, the inflection values will now be above or below the x-axis, but the x-intercepts will still be the zeros. Could be different. But by default, the inflection values are the zeros. Um, symmetry, we already said the symmetry. This is an origin symmetric function. Peyton recognized that, origin symmetry. So it's an odd function. So the consequence of that is, again, we'll write it here, tangent of negative x is the opposite of tangent of positive x. Opposite inputs have opposite outputs. So if you ever are trying to graph a tangent and you have a negative on the inside, just like with sine, you don't forget about it. You bring it out front. And then the last thing we'll just summarize here, the period is pi, not 2 pi. The default period is pi. So is your p value just pi half? Oh, yeah, let's, well, let, let's say, let's do this. So let's, let's add this. We count by half cycles. I'll add this. We count by half cycles, which means we count by pi halves. So. The B value, let's go ahead and write that. The B value is going to be pi over P. And the period is pi over the absolute value of B. Instead of 2 pi, I was going to wait till we did transformations of pi to do that or tangent, but you brought it up, so I'll just throw that out there. You're right. It's not 2 pi over P. It's pi over P. 
and we count by half cycles. All right, any questions about your new parent function tangent of x? When I say tangent of x, your brain, your mind should envision that graph right there, okay? It passes through the origin, that's an important way to remember it, and it's increasing and it has vertical asymptotes at odd pi halves. That's another way to think about it. If you want to put equations of vertical asymptotes, they occur at odd pi halves. Odd pi halves. One pi halves, three pi halves, five pi halves, seven pi halves, any odd number pi halves is your vertical asymptote location. Okay? All right, any questions on that? All right. Let's go ahead and do this. Copy the graph of tangent that you just drew and paste it down here on example two. We're gonna come up with the graph of cotangent a little bit differently. We could certainly make a table of values like we were doing uh, theoretically for tangent and we can plot the points, but look at this little note right here. Since cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent, if we know what the graph of tangent looks like, we should be able to sketch its reciprocal graph. So I'm going to choose a more bold flavor than purple. I'll choose blue and maybe increase my line quality a little bit so it stands out. Is that coming through the speaker? No, someone hijacked it. Yeah. The, the, it's, it's wide open. You can connect to it with Bluetooth. It's insignia if it shows up on your phone. Yeah, I just turned it off. Yeah. You remember during our class when this kid had like five times last year just like glaring at the Honda music? Yes. Yeah. He, he, was probably, he was probably in Miss Lincoln's room probably sitting along that back wall right there. And he's messing with his phone during class and it says insignia. Hey, I wonder where that goes. And he connects to it and then he blasts uh, Emilio or whatever, Selena Tejano. Yeah, that was fun. So I don't know, that guy was cussing though, right? Oh, was it? Oh, okay. Anyway, that was a good little break. We're gonna graph tan uh, cotangent of X now. So let's look at cotangent of x. All right, so the first thing that I'm going to do is look at where tangent has, bless you, x-intercepts. If I want to graph the reciprocal of an x-intercept, that's the reciprocal of 0. What is the reciprocal of 0? D and E, because it's a what? It's going to infinity, right? It's, inf it's infinity, so it's an asymptote. So everywhere. Where tangent has a zero, the graph of cotangent is going to have a vertical asymptote, including the y-axis. All right, so far so good, right? Now, by the same logic, wherever tangent has a vertical asymptote, cotangent should have a what? What's the reciprocal of infinity? No. Well, what's the reciprocal of zero? D and E because it's infinity. What's the reciprocal of infinity then? Zero. Zero and infinities are reciprocal. So wherever tangent has a, a vertical asymptote, cotangent is going to have an x-intercept, a zero. Got it? So I just, I traded them out. The VAs became the x-intercepts. The x-intercepts became the VAs. All right, now, phone's away because this is important. Now we have to look at the purple intermediate values. Let's start over here on the far left. The purple graph right there, just to the right of negative 2 pi, is a small positive number, a really small positive number, like 1 1,000, okay? Let's assume. What would be the reciprocal of that very small number? One one thousandth. What's the reciprocal of one one thousandth? No, the reciprocal just flips it. What's the reciprocal of one over a thousand? 
a thousand. So the reciprocal of a very small number is a very what? Big number. That's why the reciprocal of zero infinity are reciprocals. Of so, so right there, that's going to be a big number. And then right here, where tangent equals one, what's the reciprocal of one? One. So it's going to be in the same spot. So notice this function now is decreasing towards there. And if we do the same thing over here, just to the right of negative three pi halves, tangent is a really, really huge negative number. What's the reciprocal of a really, really huge negative number? A really, really small negative number. And then where tangent is negative one, what's the reciprocal of negative one? Negative one. The graph looks like this. So it, it, there's still inflection point now at the x-axis, but now it's not increasing. It's what? It's decreasing. It still launches through at the slope of negative one, but now it's a decreasing function. It looks like that. Now that looks like artwork, doesn't it? It looks kind of confusing because we have the purple graph on it, doesn't it? So. Let's go ahead and quickly sketch it again. If I were to ask you to sketch the graph of f of x equals cotangent of x, here's what I would expect you to draw. We'll do it real quickly over here. It has vertical asymptote at zero, and then you're counting by pi halves again, and then there's another vertical asymptote at pi. Looks like that. And then you got another access point at three pi halves. And then at two pi, you have another vertical asymptote. And then you just mirror it. There's negative pi halves, negative pi, vertical asymptote. So you're alternating axis, vertical asymptote, axis or inflection point, vertical asymptote. And then you got negative three pi halves. And then you extend it out and you get negative two pi. So you set the table like that first. Now notice tangent pass through the origin. Remember that? Tangent pass through the origin. Does cotangent pass through the origin, right? Text the person you're texting that no, cotangent does not pass through the origin. I think they would want to know. Yeah. But you're right. Cotangent does not pass through the origin. It has a vertical asymptote on the origin. So that's how you know you kind of offset it a little bit. You're still counting by pi halves. But now you draw a decreasing function. A decreasing function. A decreasing function. Looks like that. There's the graph of cotangent of x right there. Now it's unobscured from the graph of tangent. So notice it has some similarities to tangent. It has vertical asymptotes, uh, and the period is pi. It has inflection points like tangent, um, but it's decreasing instead of increasing. So let's go ahead and talk about the domain. What's the domain of this function? Is it all real numbers? Nope, it has vertical asymptotes too, right? So let's go ahead and list them. It's a set of all x such that x is not equal to, pick your favorite one. Where's our favorite one? Vertical asymptote. Pi works. I like pi. I like zero. X cannot equal zero plus they occur every pi, pi n, where n is an integer. Those were, that was, those were the axis points for tangent, right? What's the range of this function? Oh, it's all real numbers again. Yeah, that's easy. That's easy. Uh, what about increasing or decreasing? Which one is it? Any, any of them? Decreasing. We'll say monotonic. I'm going to use the word monotonic because it sounds like monocera, which is a unicorn. So I'm going to say monotonic uh, decreasing over the domain. All right, what about the vertical asymptotes? We have VAs at X equals, well, it's the same values from the domain that we excluded, isn't it? So it's just pi N, where N is an integer. What about the zeros? The X-intercepts, well, the zeros are going to be where the vertical asymptotes were for tangent. They trade. So it's, it's going to be x equals, uh, our favorite one is at pi halves, plus they occur every cycle, which is every pi. So pi n, where n is again an integer. 
And then symmetry. Ah, yeah, it's not y-axis symmetry. It still has origin symmetry. If you take your graph on your iPad and flip it upside down, as long as your screen is locked, it looks the exact same. So the symmetry, again, it has origin symmetry, which means it's an odd function. And so the consequence of that is this. Cotangent of a negative input is equal to the opposite of cotangent of a positive input, just like tangent. Now, that's a little different from sine and cosine. Side was odd, cosine was even. But tangent and cotangent are both odd. Do you find that peculiar? Or do you find that odd? All right, what's the period? Big P. Big P. No, how far, how far, how what's the minimum distance for this graph to repeat itself? Pi. Is that the same as tangent? That's the same as tangent. So sine and cosine both have periods of 2 pi. Tangent and cotangent have period of pi. So that means that B is 2 pi over P and vice versa. And we count, I'll put this right here, we count by half cycles, which in this case is pi halves. There, there, there you go. T-H-A-R, there, there you go. You met two new parent functions today. How do, how do you feel about them? You like them? Are they palatable? Do they go down okay? You should memorize these overnight. Memorize them overnight. Commit them to memory. Try sketching them from memory. The sketch is just as accurate as the purple graph and the blue graph. It doesn't need to be any more accurate than that. But sketch them overnight on paper, on your iPad. Make sure you can sketch them quickly. Tomorrow we're going to start doing transformations of them. I think that's a good stopping point for today. There's a little bit of time left on the bone. Comments or questions? I never thought about that, but sure, yeah. See for cotangent? Let's see. High up here, axis low. And then but you can do it for the first three points, right? High axis low. Yeah, that works. I never thought about that. So instead of chala, let's just say it's chow, right? Chow. Like you want to name your kid Chad, but you're like, no, there's too many Chads. Let's just change the D to an L. Chow. I like it. High axis low. That works. Does it work for tangent on, on Sahala? No, but you could do something similar. You could say tangent starts from axis high low, tall. I don't know. I thought it was low axis. Well, I'm starting at zero. Starting at zero. It starts on an axis there. Axis, high, low. Yeah. Whatever mnemonic helps you remember it. I never thought about uh, coming up with new ones for tangent and cotangent. I never got that creative. But you can reuse uh, cosine for cotangent. All right. Any other comments or questions? All right. Feel free to text your loved ones.